Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to come and, and speak to you guys today. And when I met with the pastors this morning, I, I thank them personally for, for asking me to, to preach on a day other than Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And I, I told them I was running out of things I appreciated about them, so it's, it's kind of nice for me to <laughs> to do something on a, on a different Sunday. Uh, this was Independence Week, and I hope that it, you kind of shifted gears a little bit along the way. You were able to maybe hit more barbecues than you're used to and, and hang out with friends and, and, uh, and, and celebrate freedom. But if I could kind of interject that a little bit, uh, we as a body of believers realize that freedom in Christ always trumps freedom of citizenship. Can you say amen to that? All right, so that's a pretty good start. So let's go ahead and get going then into the sermon. I'm, I'm going to start with a few statements. A lot of sermons start off with a few questions that they ask, but, but I'm going to give you a statement, and a statement is the closest thing to a fact that you can get. So I'm going to try to give you some kind of meat and potatoes that you can chew on, and if you like it, you can say, say amen to that, or you believe that, it, that it's true, then, then we can get going. If you want to debate this a little bit later, we can do that. But here are a couple of the facts or statements that I'd like to, to give you to get started with this. The first one is that discontent is the foundation of change because you will never change what you tolerate. So if you want to reverse that, whatever, whatever you tolerate, you will never change. And that discontent of that change or that, that wanting to change really is the key foundation of change. How many times have you said, you know, I probably ought to do something different? Can I ask you a quick question? Have your New Year's resolutions been sort of like a broken record every year? Your New Year's resolutions where you say, you know what, this year I'm going to, and then dot, dot, dot. This year is going to be the year that I get skinny, right? This year is the year that, that I'm going to read more Bible. This is the year I'm, that I'm going to get more involved in church. This is the year that I'm going to give my family uh, an example that they haven't seen in the past. This is going to be the year, and then all of a sudden, December 31st rolls around and say, you know what, I probably ought to start getting on those New Year's resolutions. And you know what? I can just hit the, the loop button. I can get right back to it again. I should probably get skinny this year. I should probably do this. I should probably do that. Whatever you tolerate, you will never change. So how do you break in toleration then, folks? And it's this. You will never become what you could be until you get angry with what you are. I didn't say smarter. I said that you will never become what you could be until you get angry with what you are. Now, this anger that I'm talking about does not equal violence. I'm not talking about a violent anger. I'm talking about an anger that brings change. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrows bring repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. It's when you come to that point, folks, you come to that cathartic moment, moment when you finally say, enough is enough. Time out. There has to be a change. I have to do something different. Something different has to happen because I'm tired of what's been happening in my life. It's that time that you come and say, you know what? Time out. My kids deserve more out of me than what I've been giving them. My spouse deserves more out of me than I've been giving them my employer, my neighbors, whatever you want to put in there, you come to a cathartic moment, and that cathartic moment brings anger if it brings change. If you want to try to solve it with psychology, if you want to try to solve it with, with, with something other than that, you've proven, at least at my age, I've proven that doesn't work. It comes to the point that you say, you know what, I am not going to let Satan have his hand in my pockets anymore. I'm just not going to let it happen anymore. You put on that fight mentality, that battle mentality, and lo and behold, when you come to that point, all of a sudden things start to change. As when you're going to say, guess what? Change is going to be there. And that is an angry sensation more than it is any other sensation at all. So I'm not talking about everybody, you know, you walk out of here and you start to become violent because of the servant sermon you heard. You obviously hadn't heard it very well. But I'm talking about an anger that you finally come to that conclusion that you say, enough. I don't need a New Year's resolution. It's just going to happen. 
And that's usually when things happen. So when you never come to that moment, it seems like you become that broken record year after year after year. Boy, you know, I wish I would have done this. Oh, I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have done that. So the last statement then, a lot of your life can be defined by what angers you. Because whatever you don't hate, you allow, and whatever you allow, you'll never change. And so you want to try to argue the fact, now wait a minute, we're talking about a sermon about anger, but what about love? Don't you understand that the beginning foundational principle of who we are and the gift that we've been given is love? And now you're talking about anger and getting angry about some things. But I'm talking about a godly love. I'm talking about a godly anger. And I'm going to ask you this simple question. Is there a chance that you're loving someone to the point that you're sending them right to an early grave? Is that love? Or when you're trying to deal with the concept of sin, you say, well, the sin is growing in that person's life, so I'll just love them even more and more and more. So I've got this much love, and they've got that much sin, and that's going to beat it. And so if you have this much sin, then you have to have this much love. Is that necessarily love? When that love is kind of escorting someone into a really huge path of destruction. I'm talking about a love that's a little bit different, and I'm talking about anger that gets you there. King David writes in Psalms, there are seven things that God hates. Solomon writes 14. I'll put the slide up there if you can. These are just the snippets of the things that God hates. And again, it's not a word we really use, but when you look at that and you start reading some of the snippets of the things that God does not like, that God detests, it's everything. Anything and everything that is keeping you away from God. That when this stuff starts to permeate into a person's life, and it's tolerated into a person's life, you can be as happy as you want, you can clap as much as you want, but you have no sense of fulfillment on what it truly means to be free. And that if those are some of the characteristics that we're dealing with, and you might be dealing with in your life, you can't read a book about psychology that's going to change that. You're going to have to come to a moment where you're going to say, it's time, it's enough, I'm tired of this, I'm sick of this. And so what are your habits? Your public habits, your private habits, some of the things you do when you don't see, when people aren't looking? Because you're not defined by your dreams, you're defined by your habits. And that's my last statement of fact. You folks are not defined by your dreams, you are defined by your habits. When I was coaching junior high track, I had an eighth grader that threw a pretty good shot and a pretty decent discus. And he was telling me all spring, he is so excited about high school football. He cannot wait till high school football starts. He said, I am going to be a freshman playing on Friday nights. I'm going to be starting varsity. I said, well, that's a pretty tall task. He said, you wait. You wait. I got it all figured out. I said, really? And so, I have a lot of doubts about freshmen wanting to play on Friday nights, but he said, I got a plan, and here was the plan. He was going to devote his whole summer to get ready for football. Morning, noon, night, and sometimes way, way into the evening, into the early mornings. He is going to devote himself all summer long to playing Madden football on the PlayStation every day. And so I gave one of those teacher looks that teachers aren't really supposed to give, and it's kind of like this. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I got it all figured out. You see, my dream is to play Friday night football as a freshman. I'm going to do it. And so he spent all summer long. He was dedicated. He was devoted. I, you know, am I assuming the right pose when you're, when you're playing Madden? Is that kind of how it looks? And he dedicated himself. He devoted himself to getting ready for that dream. He wants, to, he wants to work toward that dream. 
and he played. His mom even verified morning, noon, night, four o'clock in the morning. He'd get a little bit of sleep. He'd go and have some Captain Crunch, come back, and he'd get right in front of the TV, and he would just go, go, go. He goes, I have a dream. I have a dream. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So could I ask you a quick question? Maybe I'll ask Dan, the man, for a spokesperson. How long do you think that he lasted for two-a-days when he first started playing his freshman year? How long? Oh, you probably know. No, it's a sorry. I shouldn't ask you. Somebody shouted out, one day, first service. That's that much of one day. Lasted one practice. And he said, I am so upset. I devoted my whole life, I mean, divided my, I spent my whole summer devoting myself to playing on this football team. And my dreams are shattered. And so like a lot of parents today, they come home, the children is hurting, pain, agony. I can't believe this happened. My dreams have been squashed. And so they get on their InstaFace accounts and they start typing about how terrible the coach is, how terrible the program is, the coach has favorites, the coach doesn't care about everyone, the coach just looks at certain people and then throws the other people away because my son had a dream to play Friday night football and it's everybody else's fault. Ask coaches, see if they have to go through this. Those InstaFace things that you see on the internet, man, they just... They're supposed to be good, but they're not always good. Our habits are our future. Our habits decide our future. It's not our wants and our needs. It's the habits. It's the things that we do. And the habits are the only things that you can control. You can't necessarily control your dreams. You decide your habits. You decide your habits and what you're going to do. So the first interim ministry that I did, I was at a church. I was asked to be there four Sundays in September of 1999. And a year and a half later, I found out what an interim pastor was, what an interim pastor did. And I remember a specific point because when, we came, when I came into this situation, they had a pastor that left and left on sort of unfriendly terms. It wasn't a, a retirement or anything. I would say it's probably more negative than positive. They had an average Sunday morning worship. They had two services, traditional and contemporary. They had an average worship service of about 230 people on average. After the pastor decided to leave, they were averaging about 210. So they, they brought me in, and, and using my tactical skills and my abilities and, and my intelligence, I got it all the way down to 190 real quick. <laughs> and the church was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're saying, how long can we handle this flunky up here on Sunday mornings? This church is falling apart. What's going to happen? And people were coming up to me constantly and consistently saying, you have got to preach about church growth. You have got to preach and teach about growing this church. And it was one of the things that people it was so critical we have a church that needs to grow. We have a church that wants to grow. And this needs to be the key to, your, to the success of this church. And you need to do it. You know, you have some churches that talk about the seeker model, the seeker sensitive model. Did you know that the seeker model and the seeker sensitive model isn't the same model? We have these models and we want you to be able to get this church growing because we are falling apart. And during that time, we had a a person in the church that she had this wonderful ministry. I don't know how to explain it other than she had the ministry of unsigned letters. Have, have you ever gotten a letter that didn't have a name at the bottom that really wanted to tell you the way it really is? And then at the end of the, end of the ones, I think I've gotten one almost every church that I've been to. BF, have you ever gotten one? Dan, you have gotten one? Well, I thought you were too good looking to get one, but okay, okay. all right. You've gotten one, too. And she had this wonderful ministry of unsigned letters, and she, she sent the, a letter to our, our worship uh, director, our worship pastor, that wanted to let him know how terrible he was. You're just awful. And there's no spiritual beat that goes in your heart. 
the people that clean this church are doing more spirituality in this church than you are, and you're just you're just an awful person, and you really probably ought to leave. Because this church can't take it having someone like you around anymore, and you probably ought to just go Splitsville somewhere. In God's love, unsigned. Okay? And, and he showed me this letter, and I was mad. I, I, was really, I was really ticked off. And I was really mad because everybody kept talking to me about how we need to have teaching time and we need to have preaching time about how we're going to grow this church. And so that particular Sunday, I mentioned you guys are talking about wanting to have sermons that deal with, with uh, church growth and things like that. I said, I want to read you a letter that a brother in Christ just received this week, and I read it. And I said, now let me just ask you. I said, who's going to want to come here? And I wadded it up. I threw it out in the middle of the sanctuary. I said, either way, it's your question. You figure it out. And I left. <laughs> I left. I walked out, went to the back door, acted like I was going to leave for good. But I turned around and cracked the door open and looked at what what's happening there, what's going on. I'm sure it's my last Sunday, but <laughs> kind of like that going on. And it was dead silence, everybody just staring for, straight, straight forward, nobody, nothing. Uh, oh, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. And finally, one person stu stood up in the middle of the sanctuary, and he said, you know what, this is it. This is enough. This is, this is sad. This is not what a church should be doing. And you know what? This kind of ministry is a sick ministry, and we need to pray for that ministry because it has no bearing being in this church flock. If you ever get letters like that or you ever receive letters like that, you don't deserve either one. And it's time that we just stop. And there are people that formed a group together in the middle of the sanctuary, and they all walked up in the sanctuary, and they started praying against that particular type of ministry. And they were the ones that said, yeah, we keep wanting the church to grow, and look at the characteristics that we have in this church. And they spent the time normally that saved reserved for the sermon to pray for each other, to hold each other, to finally look at each other square in the eyes and say, you know what, this is, we've had about enough of this. Now, some people will cut and run, but there was one lady that said, you know what, you can make me mad, but you can't make me leave. This is my church. And things have to be different have to be different and I left and they took care of everything else coming back for the second service the contemporary service people came up and said hey bro do not do this at the contemporary service <laughs> do not they're not ready for this do not do this and I said I don't have a sermon ready I don't I don't know why and I did it again It's almost like hitting the loop button. A man stood up about midsection and said, enough. We're not going to play church. We're going to be church. We're not going to say that we follow Christ. We're going to follow Christ. We're going to look at the precepts of the scriptures and we're going to follow them. This type of ministry doesn't belong in this church. Some of these habits that we bring into the church on Sunday morning aren't supposed to leave. They're supposed to stay here. That's where they're supposed to be. And time after time, Sunday after Sunday, and we're so worried about whether this church is going to exist or not, does this church even exist? And they had a fervor and a fever like I've never seen before. And in eight months, the average Sunday went from 190 to 430. In eight months. People were coming from Michigan. People were coming from all different places. And it was all their success. All their success. My sermons never changed, but the church changed. They found a fever that was different than that. They found a fever than just saying, oh, love will just conquer everything. I don't know how much we talk about anger in church, but there is a type of anger that leads to something better leads to something different. So in Mark 12, we read, 
that there were a group of religious Pharisees that were trying to knock Jesus off the back porch. They were going to try to get him to say something that he shouldn't say. And if I could paraphrase what was happening, one of the religious Pharisees, probably the smartest one, and I don't know that for sure, probably the smartest one, probably the best debater, probably the best one with the most qualities to defeat or to try to get Jesus to say something that he shouldn't say. And so he went up to Jesus and said, hey, I have a coin here. He says, who does this coin belong to? And Jesus looked at it and said, who is stamped on the coin? And he said, Caesar is stamped on the coin. And he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And if I could paraphrase the rest, Jesus could be looking at the Pharisee and says, now, who is stamped on you? Who is it? And if it's not the Holy Christ, it's something else. And it's either the Holy Christ or it is something else. And revolution starts with anger. And are you ready to be angry? Are you ready to be part of the church in what it deserves? Are you ready to come on a Sunday morning and give to God exactly what he deserves? And that is a fulfillment in your life that's obviously going to fulfill other people's lives. Are you, are you just ready to do that? So would you pray with me? Father, it's to your glory that we come to you today to look and identify the things that you do not like. Reverend Billy Graham actually uses the word hate in a very famous sermon that talks about the things that you hate. And you realize that it is all those things that can separate yourself from us. Father, can we come to the conclusion that it is us who are taking step words back and not you? Can we recognize that it is our habits that are getting to us to a conclusion and not our dreams? And Father, can we pray for those habits today? For those that really have an honest ear this morning, can they literally come to grips with some of the habits that they have in their lives, some of the idiosyncrasies in their lives? Can they come to that cathartic moment or that precipice moment that they realize that it's not just stuff to dream about, it's actually stuff to take action toward? Father, can the Spirit be here as you were invited this morning to see the change and to help with the change that's happening today? Can, can marriages be healed today because of honesty? Can our parenting styles be healed today because of honesty? Can the way that we treat others be healed today because of honesty? So oftentimes we come to, to, to church or Bible study or we come to you in prayer to give us intelligence to change. Father, can I ask that instead of the word intelligence, we actually use fever and fervor? Can we come together as a congregation of believers to realize that the enemy wants to give us anything that will separate us from the kingdom of God? Can we identify that and can we fight that? Can this be so because we know that you are so? Can this be good because we know that you are good? And can we realize that there is a power that we cannot create to solve our problems? That power specifically comes from you and it is ready 
as soon as someone says enough. Father, can that be a word that resonates today? Enough, 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 enough. Can that be something that people have in the back of their minds all day today and all day tomorrow, maybe even Tuesday, maybe even to next Saturday, that that word keeps popping up into their mind? Enough, enough, enough. Can that be the starter for the fuel that will take place to solve their problems? I pray this in your holy name and I pray that we come to grips and conclude that that is exactly what you deserve. May there be gifts of change starting immediately. And all of God's people said, Would you stand with us? How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, and Jesus Christ, my living hope. could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has
Sing that out one more time. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. One more time, every voice. Just see you guys, sing it out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. 